This time of teaching is brought to you by State Street Baptist Church. Hey guys, welcome once again to worship at State Street Baptist Church. It is Memorial Day weekend and we want to express right off the bat a word of gratitude to our service men and women who currently served in the armed, serve in the armed forces and also the ones who have served in the past. And we also want to just say thank you so much to those families who have lost servicemen and women in the line of duty, in the line of service. And that is what we're doing this weekend is celebrating and remembering the sacrifice that they made. You know, one of the things that Scripture tells us is that we're never more like Jesus than when we're giving and sacrificing in the way that Jesus does. As a matter of fact, Jesus said it like this in John chapter 15. He says, Greater love has no one than this, that he lay down his life for his friends. As a matter of fact, I want to invite you as we engage in worship this morning to remember the greatest and the most ultimate sacrifice that was made for us all through God's Son in laying down His life for us all. And so I want to invite you to read with me in John chapter 15 where that passage comes from, where that verse comes from about the vine and the branches. And I'm going to begin in verse 1 and read through verse 17. Jesus says here, I am the true vine, and my Father is the gardener. He cuts off every branch in me that bears no fruit, and while every branch that does bear fruit, He prunes, so that it will be even more fruitful. You are already clean because of the word I have spoken to you. Remain in me, and I will remain in you. No branch can bear fruit by itself. It must remain in the vine neither can you bear fruit unless you remain in me I am the vine and you are the branches if a man remains in me and I in him he will bear much fruit but apart from me you can do nothing if anyone does not remain in me he is like a branch that is thrown away and withers and such branches are picked up and thrown into the fire and burned and if you remain in me, and my words remain in you, ask whatever you wish, and it will be given to you. This is, my, this is to my Father's glory, that you bear much fruit, showing yourselves to be my disciples. As the Father has loved me, so I have loved you. Now remain in my love, and if you obey my commands, you will remain in my love, just as I have obeyed my Father's commands, and remain in His love. I have told you this so that my joy may be in you and that your joy may be complete. My command is this, love each other as I have loved you. Greater love has no one than this that He lay down His life for His friends. And you are my friends if you do what I command. I no longer call you servants because a servant doesn't know his master's business. Instead, I have called you friends. For everything that I learned from the Father, I have made known to you. You didn't choose me, but I chose you and appointed you to go and bear fruit, a fruit that will last. And then the Father will give you whatever you ask in my name. And this is my command again to love each other. And guys, as we think about the love that's been given to us in God, and especially to us in Christ our Savior, we think about the demonstration of His love. God says that He has demonstrated love for us in this, that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. And for that reason, He deserves worship this morning. So will you join me as we pray and we engage in worship this morning? Father in heaven, we just want to say thank you for who you are. The greatest sacrifice given to us through your son Jesus, he laid down his life so that we could have a relationship with you. 
Father, we want to say thank you for who you are, what you've done for us and your son Jesus. God, we thank you for those who have also reflected your love and reflected your character in the ways that they have sacrificed and laid down their lives for their countrymen. God, on this weekend, we honor them, but we worship you and you alone. In Jesus' name, amen. What wonderful news it is that God himself calls us his friend. We are no longer enemies of God, but because of Christ Jesus, we are sons and daughters of God. Today, as we worship, I invite you to sing as we recognize and worship the one who paid the cost of our salvation so that we could have eternal life and joy in our Father. Watch and pray, find in me thine all in all, cause Jesus paid it all, and all to him I owe. Sin had left a crimson stain, he washed it white as snow. soul to save my lips shall still be we do indeed worship you today for you are worthy of our praises god we thank you for for the sacrifice of christ jesus god that he would wash away our sins that we may be pure holy and blameless before you so that even today we can worship you not through temples not through sacrifices not through curtains or priests or any of these other things god because you have given us your spirit to indwell us, we can simply worship you, call you Father, and praise your name today. In your name I pray. Amen. Thank you, Jed. Rejoice in the death, resurrection, 
and love of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. And thank you, Bobby, again for a uh, remembering uh, our, our veterans and, and especially those families who've had loved ones who've given the ultimate sacrifice to that we can enjoy the freedoms and the liberties that we have in this amazing country that we were so blessed to live in. Uh, before I get into my message, I want to just remind you of the big, big news. Of course, the big news is that this time next week, we'll be gathered here to worship our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And uh, we're going to actually release uh, a new video. It's going to be released tomorrow, and it's going to give you a lot of those details. And as always, you can go to our website at statestreetbaptist.org, and right there on our front page, you'll, you'll, you'll have a link that gives you all the different things that are going on, how things are different. Things are going to look radically different. They're going to look, uh, we're going through a lot of transitions and a lot of changes, and we're trying to prepare you for those things. And we're just asking for you to please be patient as, again, this is all uncharted territory. And uh, again, we appreciate your prayer and your patience and your love uh, in these crazy, unprecedented times. Uh, but saying all that, we're still here to rejoice and celebrate our risen Savior, Jesus Christ. Now, for the past two-plus months, we've been focused specifically on uh, God's sovereignty, of Him being in control. Now, I'm going to transition just a little bit, and I want to talk about us now. As we see things start coming back to a little bit of normalcy, that you're going to see this process, this, this, these changes are going to be gradual. Now, it was interesting at the beginning of March, man, things were just like normal. Everything was exactly as we've always known it. And then a few weeks later, what happens, man? We are just in a whole different world. And so life, in, in, just in general, whether you're a believer or not, is full of adapting is full of, of um, improvising. It's full of overcoming different type of situations that come our way. It doesn't matter if you're a believer or not. But as believers, we understand that we don't do this in our own power. We do this through the power of the Holy Spirit. And so today I want to talk about us not focusing so much on the past. I think it's real easy for us to, to look at these present circumstances and to say, oh my goodness, I really wish we could go back to March 1st. And, and we, things were like that. And, and, and it, listen, there's nothing wrong with being a little nostalgic. There's nothing wrong with looking back favorably in the past in whatever regard. However, it is wrong to live in the past and, not, and, 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 and allow the past to immobilize us to do the kingdom work that God wants us to do today. The, the funny thing is, 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 again, these are all different changes that we all have to contend with. But everything new is going to get old. We're always in this, this, this flux, this change in our lives. In 2007, the new iPhone came out. Brand new iPhone. They'd never seen one before. The first iPhone came out. It was $599 for an 8-gig iPhone. Now, you could get the 4-gig, and, and you would have to only pay $499 for that. But the, the point I want to make is this. Who wants an iPhone 1 now? Nobody. Why? Because it's obsolete. It's, it's, it's great to be nostalgic and go, wow, that would be neat to have one just for historical reference. But no one wants an iPhone. I don't even think an iPhone 1 would even work on our networks today. And so even this idea of the pandemic that we're going through, these are all changes. They're, they're going to be different. Uh, and, and, and I remember when 9-11 uh, happened, how air, air travel changed. It was different. We adjusted. We adapted. We overcame. And we will with this as well. So I want to remind us to not focus so much on the past. We've got a goal that we're pursuing. That's to honor and glorify Christ no matter what the circumstance is. So I want to ask you to read with me uh, or, or read, uh, go along with me in, in Philippians chapter 3, verses 10 through 14. Paul's trying to encourage, encourage a church at Philippi, and he's reminding them of the newness of Christ they have and how God wants to use them mightily even when they're under heavy persecution. Philippians 3, verses 10 through 14. Paul says, My goal is to know him, Jesus, and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his suffering being conformed to his death assuming that I will somehow reach the resurrection from among the dead. Not that I've already reached the goal or, or am already perfect, but I make every effort to take hold of it because I also have been taken hold of by Christ Jesus. 
Brothers and sisters, I do not consider myself to have taken hold of it, but one thing I do, forgetting what is behind and reaching forward to what is ahead. I pursue as my goal the promised prize of of God's heavenly call in Christ Jesus. Now, what Paul is really saying, the bottom line is, is if you want to be a mature believer in Christ Jesus, you learn from the past, you appreciate the past, you can even celebrate the past, but we live in the future and we, I mean, we live in the present and we press on toward the goal of what God wants us to do for his glory now. Now, there's a lot of different points I could pull out of these passages, but for time's sake, I'm just going to look at two distinct points Paul's trying to make here. The first of all, just again to remind you, he knew that the church at Philippi was losing heart. They were under heavy persecution. And I know some of us have maybe been losing heart because of the circumstances that we're in. And again, we're not being persecuted for our faith. And, and here's, here's the thing. We're all in this situation together internationally. This is a pandemic. So as we look at all of us in this situation, it's not just focused on the church, but we as a church have to contend with it as well. And so Paul's trying to remind them, listen, don't let the past dictate what's going to happen in the future. And the first thing he's trying, the first point he's trying to make is this. Suffering is the pathway to a new and mature walk in Christ Jesus. Paul makes it abundantly clear, and, and man, I, we can't hear this enough, that the way Christ, there's no way Christ could have been glorified through the resurrection if he had not first died on the cross for our sins. And so he says, the man, nobody likes the death part, you know, in terms of, of us dying or, or even Christ dying. That, that thought is, is, is initially is, 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 is heart-wrenching. But you understand why he did it, and we glorify Christ for his amazing sacrifice. And we, 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 we relish the cross, and the cross is the major center point for the Christian church today. Why? Because it's because of Christ's sacrifice that we can have eternal and abundant life with God through the sacrifice of Christ. Christ. And so Paul's trying to remind them, and here, here's, we all, I think, it's human nature, we want the glory without the suffering, but that never happens. It never happens. We don't look for suffering, but anything worth obtaining is going gonna, is gonna, is gonna to cause pain. And it's not like we're trying to obtain salvation. What we're trying to obtain is sanctification. We want to become more like Christ. Our salvation is secure. So he says, but don't, don't focus on the past. Look at the future. God's got great plans for you, church. So this is what he says in Philippians 3, 10 and 11 again. He goes, my goal, my ultimate goal is to know him, is to know Christ. That's our goal, is to know Jesus and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his suffering. So, he, matter of fact, Paul says, man, I, I know I'm going to suffer. I'm going to suffer, I'm going to suffer mightily. And he goes, I'm not looking forward to that suffering, but I'm going to embrace it to the point of I know God's going to use that suffering to make me more like him. And he goes on, being conformed to him, uh, being conformed to his death, assuming that I will somehow reach the resurrection from among the dead. Again, Paul, <laughs> he was no stranger to suffering. He suffered mightily in his ministerial days after he came to know Christ as his Lord and Savior. Let me kind of give you, a, a, this is what Paul says actually in 2 Corinthians chapter 11, verses 24 through 27. This is some of the suffering he went through, okay? He goes, five times I've received 40 lashes minus one from the Jews. Three times I was beaten with rods. Once I received a stoning. There, three times I was shipwrecked. I have spent a night and a day in the open sea. On frequent journeys, I faced dangers from rivers, dangers from robbers, dangers from my own people, dangers from the Gentiles, dangers in the city, dangers in the wilderness, dangers at sea, and dangers among false brothers. Toll and hardship, many sleepless nights, hunger and thirst, often without food, cold and without clothing. So Paul's trying to remind them, listen, suffering is inevitable for anybody, believer or non-believer. And he says, man, I've been through a lot. He goes, but I understand this. When we undergo suffering, especially for the cause of Christ, it does a lot of things. It builds our character. It transforms us more into the image of Christ. It demonstrates our faith. It reminds us that, listen, we are not our own. We've been bought for it with a price. This earth is not my home. My home is in heaven with Christ. 
And also, it prepares us to do great and even more mighty work for the Lord. So he goes, listen, I don't look for this suffering, but you know what? I can, I'll count it as currency that I can do even greater things to glorify my Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. So suffering is the pathway to a mature walk with Christ. The second point I want to make out, make today is this. Dwelling in the past always hinders your future and squelches the power of the Holy Spirit. Look at verses 12 through 14 here again. He goes, not that I've already reached this goal or, 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 or am already perfect, but I make every effort to take hold of it because I also have been taken hold of by Christ Jesus. Brothers and sisters, I do not consider myself to have taken hold of it, but one thing I do, forgetting what's behind and pressing on towards the goal, forgetting what's behind and reaching forward to what's ahead. I pursue as my goal the price promised by God, heavenly call, God's heavenly call in Christ Jesus. Now, we can make the mistake of living in the past in two ways, basically. We can coast into the future on our past successes and thinking, you know what, I've done pretty good. I'm doing better than most. By the way, that's always a danger, dangerous game when we play that comparison game. When we think we're doing better than most or maybe not as good as most, that is never ends well. So please don't do that. I'm speaking from experience. So we, but one way we can, we can make that danger of living in the past is think, you know what, I've done good. I can kind of coast. I'm doing better than most. And that's exactly what the enemy wants. He wants us to be satisfied in terms of us uh, of the past work that we've done. But as long as we draw breath into our lungs, we are not done doing kingdom work on this earth. What we have to focus on, what we need to be uh, really our heart's desire, is we want to be content without being complacent. There's a distinct difference between contentment and complacent. Complacent to be content, contentment is when you accept the reality of your situation without complaint or resentment. When you're content, you work on the things you can change, you accept the things that you can't, and you refuse to be disheartened regardless of the situation. In other words, and I say this all the time, we don't let our present circumstances steal our joy. When you are complacent, you have this good enough attitude, and that good enough attitude never honors or glorifies Christ Jesus. It's, it's lazy, and it's coasting, right? Paul's heart, Paul's heart, when we read in this passage in Philippians, to press on towards the goal is evidence that he's not complacent. And Paul had done a lot of kingdom work by now. He's done a lot of kingdom work, and he says, man, I'm still pressing on until... The last breath leaves my body, I'm going to press on. I'm going to do the things that God wants me to do. The second way we can make a mistake of living in the past is, is total opposite. We can let our past immobilize us, or our past failures immobilize, uh, mobil, immobilize us to where we won't even try. I'm going to give you another 2007 reference. I don't know why it's about 2007 today, but I talked about the, the iPhone coming out in 2007. Well, in 2007, there was a great commercial by Nike, and it was one where Michael Jordan was featured. And this is what Michael Jordan said. I love this. He goes, I missed more than 9,000 shots in my career. I've lost almost 300 games. 28 times I've been trusted to, to take the game-winning shot and missed I have failed over and over and over again in my life, and that's why I succeed. I remember seeing, there's actually a great documentary now, I think, on Netflix regarding Michael Jordan. I hadn't seen it. I want to see it. But I remember one year uh, where, where, where you saw his game go to another level. And what he understood is he had certain components of the game down pat, but there were other components that it really need worked on. So in the offseason, that's all he did was work on his weaknesses. And that's why he became such a complete and dominant basketball player, arguably the best basketball player that we've ever seen, right? And But what did it come naturally? Well, sure, he had natural talent, but he worked hard. He didn't let those past missed shots dictate what's going to happen in the future. He just kept working. He kept pressing on toward his goal, right? So it is oftentimes with the Christian life. I know sometimes we see people who we think they have it all together. And you think, oh, my goodness, if I could just be as faithful as that brother in Christ. Or, man, if I could be as faithful as this sister in Christ. And we look at these folks, but you got you to understand, you know what? We're all sin and falling short of the glory of God. 
me as your lead pastor, Jed and Bobby, your, your whole pastoral staff, guess what? We have failed miserably, miserably in a lot of different ways. But we understand that we don't stay mired in those failures. We learn from them and we move on. Even Paul himself, look what Paul says in Romans 7, 19. He goes, for I do, for, for I do not do the good that I want to do. Because for the, I, the good things I want to do, I don't do. But I practice the evil that I do not want to do. So even Paul, he's not perfect. He's struggling. He's been empowered by the Holy Spirit. He's seeking God wholeheartedly, and he's still failing. But he's not allowing those failures to dictate what God wants him to do now. As a matter of fact, I like what Christ told him in 2 Corinthians 12, 9. This is what he said. But he, Jesus, said to me, my grace is sufficient for you. For my power is perfect in weakness. Therefore, I, I will most gladly boast of all the more about my weakness so that Christ's power may reside in me. And he says, man, you look at me, I'm just a man. Anything you see happening in and through me that is awesome and glorifying to God, understand that's the Holy Spirit's work in me. And I'm just submitting to the power of the Holy Spirit, seeking him wholeheartedly. And he goes, man, I, I, you know how weak I am, he says. I, I'll, I'll even boast about my weaknesses. Why? Because I want you to understand, any strength you see in me, Paul says, is because of the work of the Holy Spirit and me giving him total access to my being that I can glorify him. Not being mired in the past, not coasting on my past successes. I'm pressing on toward the goal. And that's what God wants us to do as well. When we pursue God 100% of who we are, we will do some incredibly wonderful, radical things that will glorify God mightily. And we get the, it, here's the beautiful part, and I, and I say this oftentimes. When we are walking faithfully with the Lord, He gets the glory and we get the joy. And that's what this world needs to see. They need to see our true identity, and the true identity of those who love Christ is drenched with joy, non-circumstantial joy. Why? Because of the finished work of Jesus Christ, because he walked sinlessly on this earth, because he took the wrath that was due to us, because he defeated death, because he gives us the person of the Holy Spirit that we can have this vibrant relationship with God through the Spirit. So we have a lot to be joyful about. The opposite of this is, 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 a, is a tragedy to this world. A joyless Christian, as a matter of fact, is an, is, is an oxymoron. There there's really should be no such thing. It doesn't mean we're always happy, but it does mean that we have this, this unshakable joy because of the finished work of Christ Jesus. I pray that as we start to transition and kind of get back to some normalcy, we understand that that may not change. That we're, we're, that this world's like a roller coaster. It looks like maybe things are, are getting a little better, but we don't know what the future's going to hold. But here's the beautiful part. We know who holds the future. And that's why we pursue Christ with all our heart. And I'll leave you with this passage, one that I've already uh, given to you many, many times before. But remember this in Matthew 6, 33. But seek first, as Jesus is saying, seek first his kingdom and his righteousness, and all these things will be given to you as fur, uh, be given to you as well. So my prayer, as we look forward to a lot of us gathering together next Sunday, May 31st, understand that some things are going to take stay consistent. We're not going to dwell on the past. We're going to learn from it. We're going to move on. We're going to press on toward the goal. And we're going to seek first God and his glory no matter what. That, those are consistent and constants no matter if we're in a pandemic, if we're not in a pandemic, no matter what. And that's the beautiful part about Scripture. It doesn't matter what's going on globally or with the circumstances around us. God's word is timeless, and the Holy Spirit works through all the different messes that are going on. And even God can use these messes for his glory. And so my prayer is as you are seeking God's wisdom and his discernment of what you're going to be doing, some of, it, some of you may want to stay home because maybe you're not feeling well or are you just not comfortable yet. That is fine. Other of you are, are chomping at the bit to come back. And you know what? We look forward to that as well. So wherever you are, you, you just faithfully seek God. And if you're here, we rejoice. If you're not here, you're going to be able to still see this via our website uh, uh, the sermon via our website as well. So understand, we're going to celebrate. We're going to stay unified as a, as a body of Christ. And listen, church, State Street.
<laughs> We're going to press on toward the goal. God bless you. And we'll see you next Sunday. Would you pray with me, please? Father God, we are, again, humbled <laughs> and so thankful that you are so patient with us, that you love us, God, even, God, when we are mired in our own selfishness and our own uh, just junk that, God, we bring into our relationship with you. God, remind us that this past can be a beautiful thing to celebrate and, and, and we can rejoice in past victories. And remind us, God, that we don't look at past failures and let that dictate the future. God, regardless of what happens in the past, God, I pray we learn from it, good or bad, and we continue to press on toward the goal. And that goal is to glorify you, Christ, above all else. Thank you again, God, for this amazing time for us to worship you together as a church family. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Thanks for joining us for this time of worship. For more information about State Street Baptist Church, you may visit our website at statestreetbaptist.org.